Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Wildlife Wednesday. Hi, Yarmila. Good to see you. Likewise, Ryan. Nice to be here. We are, in fact, live at this moment. So if you're seeing us on the screen and you have access to the chat, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear where you're watching us from. Let us know where you are at this particular moment in time on this May edition of Wildlife Wednesday. And as, as the rain comes pouring down outside, I'm reminded, Yarmila, that of course this is planting season. This is really like peak garden time. Gardens are on people's minds. What have you got going on in your garden right now? Oh, I have lots going on. I have a very shady sort of woodland garden and I'm seeing all the spring ephemerals coming up. And actually many of them have already finished flowering like bloodroot, um, but my wild geraniums are just beautiful right now. Yeah. Oh yes, mine are blooming too, that bright pink. I love it. And um, on my balcony garden, I've got my yellow pimpernels are blooming. And I've even started to see some little um, green metallic sweat bees coming up and visiting oh. me on my balcony. So it's a oh. very, very exciting time of year. And of course, you know, um, as a botanist, it is what I'm trying to tell all of everyone while we're thinking about gardening, while it's on our minds is, a wonderful thing that you can do at this time of year is think about native species to plant in your gardens, wherever you are. It's really a wonderful thing that you can do to take any space, whether that's a balcony, a backyard, a rooftop, a boulevard, and you can transform that into a habitat for wildlife. And all you have to do is plant native plants, which are also beautiful <laughs> and amazing <laughs> species. Um, so today, we're going to be talking a little bit about one of the amazing benefits that you get when you plant native species, which is attracting pollinators. So pollinators are a kind of wildlife. And, you know, most people think about butterflies. And we're also going to be talking about moths, uh, which we'll talk more about that later. And Yarmila, you're going to be talking about bees. That's right. So, yeah. So that's really exciting. I, I hope everyone is excited for that. We've got some wonderful pictures to share with everyone. And before we get into that, just a quick introduction. So again, my name is Ryan Godfrey. I am your personal botanist. Um, so feel free to ask any kinds of questions. The chat is available. I can see it. We'll have a Q&A section a little bit later. Now is the time to get your, your planty questions answered. Um, and you know, as a botanist, I spend a lot of time gallivanting about in the field, taking pictures of plants, and very often along with those plants are insects. Insects of various types, including these butterflies and moths and bees. And the reason that that's the case, see here we go, we got some monarchs on that Joe Pye weed. Um, and so the, the whole thing here is that in ecology and in evolutionary biology, Plants and insects in particular have, are super, super tight. They're really, really close. Um, their relationships are profound. They've been co-evolving with each other for many, many thousands of years. And so they really go hand in hand. So you plant the plants, you get the insects. And that's a really good thing because insects are a super important part of the food chain. So they feed all those animals higher up um, in the food chain. So that's really what all of my work is about. Just try to get people to restore habitat using native plants. And I do a lot of that work right alongside my colleague, Yarmila. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, so yeah, my name is Yarmila Bechka Lee, and uh, I'm a specialist with the restoration and regeneration team here at WWF Canada. And uh, during my time at WWF, I have worked on a variety of conservation issues, including wildlife toxicology, species at risk, and sustainable seafood. But now I get to manage our In the Zone program, which is all about helping people create that much needed habitat for pollinators and other wildlife in their gardens. So as Ryan mentioned, whether you have a, a backyard, a rooftop or balcony garden, really any green space where you can add a native plant can become an in the zone garden. And so through the program, we have a variety of resources to help you on your journey to create that habitat. We have garden guides, how-to guides, uh, plant lists. We have experts like Ryan and some other colleagues that can help you with sticky questions. And 
we have the in the zone sign, of course, yes. Um, and then we have a really, really important tool. It's called the garden tracker. And that's something that everyone can contribute to and is important in helping us to show the overall impact of the program. So that you know that every little bit that you do by putting in native plants in your garden ladders up into creating a healthier and more resilient habitat. So the goal of In the Zone is really to grow more native plants which support wildlife and that help fight the dual crises of bio biodiversity loss and climate change. It's, it's what we like to call a win-win-win situation. Absolutely. Yep. Win for us and our gardens, win for the pollinators, and it's a win for the planet. Yeah. And it's really, it's a big picture thing, this whole ecosystem ecology thinking. But today, what we're going to do next is we're going to zoom in a little bit onto some particular species that you might be likely to find in your garden. And you could go out and look for them. You could take some pictures and identify, share those pictures on social media. And I hope by the end of this session, you'll have learned a few interesting facts. And in, in fact, we we're actually going to quiz you a little bit later on. We have trivia, so you better pay attention. Uh, open your ears, open your minds, and, and get ready to learn. And the first species that we're going to learn about is a beautiful butterfly called the Painted Lady. I think we've got a picture of the Painted Lady. There she is. Of course, not all Painted Ladies are ladies. Half of them are gentle butterflies <laughs> as well. Um, and here they are on their very favorite plant, um, which are thistles. So a lot of people think thistles um, are, oh, what's the purpose of a thistle? That's just a weed. Well, in fact, thistles are the host plants for Painted Lady butterflies. So that means that just like how the monarch butterfly has, has a specialized host plant, which are milkweeds, the, if you want to see this Painted Lady butterfly, you, it's crucially important that you have thistles around. Um, mm -hmm. People also, oh, go ahead. You have oh, no, I just had a question. Speaking of uh, monarchs, um, I know that they mi migrate, but I was wondering, do other butterflies, including the Painted Lady, do so as well? Absolutely. Yeah, this is something that I, I would love more people to know about, that the monarchs are not the only migratory species of butterfly. In fact, Painted Ladies and the other uh, members of the Lady Butterfly group um, are also migratory. So they do not overwinter anywhere in Canada. They're, they're a little bit, um, they, it's a little bit too cold for them. So they actually, um, flock together every spring and fly up from further south in the continent and they they get here and they look a little bit tattered and a little bit dull and the very very first thing that they do in the spring is they look for their host plants so they're looking for thistles um, and they lay their eggs those eggs hatch into caterpillars which munch on the thistle leaves and then those grow into the second generation the summer generation of uh, painted ladies which are much sort of much more colorful, they're larger, and um, they're sort of fresh and glossy and new. Um, and then in the fall, um, if those butterflies have not become food for birds or mammals, then it is thought, although we're still learning a lot more about um, the life cycles of these and many other butterflies, uh, it's thought that many of them will actually fly back down south. Mm -hmm. um, now the Painted Lady, is being migratory is, has actually spread very far um, on planet Earth, including in the United Kingdom. And over there, they have a wonderful name for them that also reminds us of their host plant, which is Cynthia of the Thistle. What do you think of that, Yarmola? That's a very noble sounding name. I love it. Yes, <laughs> Cynthia of the Thistle. Indeed, very indeed. Nice. Yeah. And and to, to, so to identify, you know, it can be difficult sometimes with these fluttery little creatures. Of course, you absolutely can run after them and try to get a photograph if you're lucky enough. But what you're looking for um, in the Painted Lady is um, an orange pinky color with black markings and white spots near the tips. And if you get up close and if you manage to see one while it's sort of landed on a thistle maybe, you will actually see four eye spots on the undersides of the the hind wings, so sort of the lower mm. wings. And that's how you'll be absolutely certain that you're looking at a painted lady. Mm. Cool. Now, I've heard of American ladies. Is that another common name for the painted lady? 
Good question, Yarmila. So um, American ladies are a relative. They're a, a, what we call a sister taxon um, to the painted ladies. And um, they also use thistles and other members of the aster family as their host plant. And the main difference, uh, if you could get up close enough, is that you'll notice instead of seeing four eye spots, you'll only see two eye spots on the bottom. And by eye spot, you know, I mean, it's got a, a color and then it's got white around that and then black around that. So it looks like an eyeball. Um, so that's all about those ladies. But I want to tell you a little bit more about um, about some other beautiful butterflies. So, so one that I see quite frequently um, and they would should be arriving around this time are the red admirals. I think we've got a nice picture of red admirals there on a beautiful aster. Um, and red admirals, their host plant, a different type of plant altogether, is a stinging nettle. Stinging nettle, indeed. So again, both thistles and nettles, people think like, oh, that's, that's just a weed. But in fact, no, that plant has a really important purpose. Um, if you want to see these red admirals, got to have their host plants around. Hey, and by the way, at the same time, a lot of people ask me, what can I plant in my garden that won't get eaten by squirrels or deer or rabbits whatever you have in your area and i can tell you the thistles and <laughs> the singing nettles will be just fine so that's a great way to fill uh to fill your garden up um now we've got one more species to take a look at of butterfly and that is the baltimore checker spot a beautiful look at that striking orange black and white pattern um and this this creature's host plant um, is the white turtle head flower, um, which is a beautiful wetland plant. Unfortunately, uh, wetland habitats across eastern North America are are diminishing. Um, they've been a lot of them have been drained or otherwise uh, changed in in their nature, so that white turtle heads don't really, you don't find them very much anymore. So this is a perfect example of a plant that you can grow in your garden that's really replacing habitat that has been lost or destroyed. Now, the final interesting point about the Baltimore checker spot is that um, although their populations have been declining over the past decades, you're starting to maybe see a little bit of recovery in those populations. And that is partially attributed to the fact that um, they're adapting. They're actually adapting mm -hmm. to um, new conditions in which they they can change their host plant a little bit. So there's an introduced species called English plantain, which is a naturalized species. You often find it around um, human uh, areas. And Baltimore checker spot caterpillars, the baby, baby, babies still need white turtle head. But when they get a little bit older, they can actually switch over onto English plantain. And that's mm -hmm. helping the populations recover. But I wouldn't count on that, folks, mm -hmm. for all species. It happens to be the case with this one, but we really do need those native plants for other things. Um, yeah. Now, Yarmila, I would love for you to now talk with us a little bit about bees. And I'm sure you want to talk with us about honeybees, right? Well, it's thanks, Ryan. It's funny you should say that because I think most people, when they do uh, think about bees, they immediately think of honeybees. And um, it's pretty natural. We eat the honey they make and we talk about them a lot in the media. But um, actually, they're not native to North America. Um, but the cool thing is, did you know that Canada has about 850 different species of native bees? Isn't that amazing? Wow, That's so many bees. <laughs> so many bees. And so there are bumblebees, of course, but also minor bees, sweat bees, a sample of which you can see on the screen now, um, leaf cutter bees, cuckoo bees. There, there are so many. And um, they're, they're really quite uh, very important for as pollinators, but really just very cool. Um, so today we're going to talk about the rusty patched bumblebee. Huh. And um, so, as you can imagine, it's called that because of that cool little rust patch on its abdomen. And um, it's it's one of our medium to large size bees. And the neat, well, what I find fascinating about this bee is the fact that up until very recently in the 1970s, it was really abundant. It was a very common uh, bee species that you could see in southern Ontario and southern Quebec. and 
but then something happened and it started to decline really quickly in the 90s. And by 2009, that's the last time that anybody saw it in the wild and recorded a sighting. Um, by 2012, it was on the Federal Species at Risk Act, uh, Schedule 1, and it was listed as endangered. So um, that's that's really concerning that in such a short time amount, uh, a short span that it went from being super abundant to endangered. Um, yeah. mm. And so we don't know exactly what all the reasons are that it is uh, listed as endangered and why it's in such, uh, the populations have decreased so much, but um, habitat fragmentation, of course, is probably a, a, a key culprit in this. Um, we have disease and competition from non-native bees, like the honeybees. Uh, there's, you know, widespread uh, pesticide use. And of course, climate change will also play a role in all this. So um, this bee needs our help. Um, and it's it's actually really interesting because it's one of those bees that um, is a generalist. So it forages on all sorts of native plants and crops. It's really important as a uh, pollinator. It emerges really early in the spring and forages late into the fall. So, you know, it's it's used to a wide variety of habitats and um, and yet still it's in trouble. But if... Uh, yeah, well, I just wanted, yeah. To, I wanted to wonder, I've always had this question. I always see bees, bumblebees sort of foraging around in the flowers, but where do they go when they are not foraging. Yeah, yeah. Well, when they're foraging, um, they, I'll, I'll answer that in a second, um, they they like to hit a whole variety of plants, like I mentioned, right? So we have wild columbine and Virginia bluebells in the spring, and then milkweeds and um, goldenrods later in the fall to sustain them throughout the, the season. But when they're not foraging, they are... Um, finding other bits of habitat that are really important to them, like bare empty ground, a bare, bare soil, right? Because they Ooh. like to burrow in there and nest in there. Um, in fact, um, about 90% of rusty patched uh, bumblebees will nest in bare ground. So it's really important if you want to do something else for um, the bee species uh, is to create some bare patches in your ground so that you can provide that habitat for nesting. Um, oh. They also like twig and rock piles and, and standing stems. So, and most importantly, no pesticides. Of course. So, okay. That's a really yeah. good point. So it's, you're telling me that the plants are important, of course, mm -hmm. but that's not all we can do. We can also create right. varied habitat for this species and for many others by leaving bare patches, rocks, yeah. twigs. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, the one thing that I wanted to tell you about that I found uh, really cool about the rusty butch, ooh, that's a mouthful, <laughs> rusty patch bumblebee is that when it goes to get nectar from a flower, it actually does it by biting a hole on the inside ooh. of it and then sucking up the nectar with its tongue. And ah. this is called nectar robbing. So that's, that's kind of a, a neat and naughty way to to get at its uh, at nectar source. I think I get it from the plant's perspective. That's kind of cheating, right? Because totally. the plant really wants that bumblebee to come around and get dusted with pollen, so yeah. that it can then move on to the next plant and and do the service of pollination. But you're telling me that these these bees sometimes um, do not play that game. They, no. they, they do yeah. they do it a different way. Oh, that's very sneaky. Yeah, it's very <laughs> sneaky. Yeah, so. As we were saying, you know, native plants are obviously really, really important to plant and to create other little bits of habitat with the bare ground or twigs. But the other thing that you can do to help um, rusty patch bumblebees and other bees, native bees, is to report sightings. So if you see a bee, take a picture of it and you can upload it to uh, a number of community science organizations such as Bumblebee Watch or iNaturalist and that helps um, gather you know information and that's then used by scientists to help the bees recover so that's it's something important that everyone can do. Amazing amazing I love those bees we're just going to quickly come to the other side of the butterfly and moth question by the way together butterflies and moths are called um, Lepidoptera, that is the group, and 
I was very impressed to hear 850 species of bees, but I will have you know that there are 5,257 species of Lepidoptera in Canada. Isn't that wild? Um, and for every one butterfly species, there's actually nine more species of moths. So it really, I mean, if you care about these pollinators, you should really be focusing a little bit on moths, at least. Now, I can understand why a lot of people maybe have not paid so much attention to all of these species of moths. And the reason is many of them are very, very, very tiny. They're called micro moths. So they're mm. under one centimeter large. So you may even just think that it's a a seed or a blowing piece mm -hmm. of leaf, uh, but in fact, that is a a creature of a living being called a micro moth. And um, similar to what you were saying, Yarmila, about about creating bare patches and varied habitat in your wildlife garden, um, it's there's something else that you can do for these moths and and um, butterflies which is to leave the leaves on mm. the ground. And the importance of this is that many of these micro moths and the macro moths, the bigger ones, and the butterflies, they overwinter in that leaf litter. That's their, their little blanket. It's their little insulating piece of habitat. And if we clean up those leaves in the spring and send them out to be composted, you're actually composting those pollinators, which is, that's not what we want to do, right? We want to support the entire life cycle of these creatures. So um, that's an important thing to note. Now, another thing about moths that I would love to say is a lot of people think that what makes the difference between a moth and a butterfly is what, Yarmila? Nighttime, well, daytime. Well, that nighttime, daytime, yeah. You yeah. see the moths at night and the butterflies during the day. Exactly. Very common misconception i'm afraid to say because there are actually daytime active moths and there are nighttime active butterflies so unfortunately although that rule is generally kind of mostly true i'm going to give you three more things that you can look at next time you see a fluttery being um, to tell whether it's a moth or a butterfly so the first one is about the wing posture so how those wings sit when the, the creature is at rest and so for moths you'll find that they are they are flat so they're either flat and open or they're flat and kind of folded along the back whereas for a butterfly they're up they're upright like this and they sort of they like to do kind of this sort of thing butterfly okay so that's one difference second difference is um about their their life cycle so the butterflies, when they're metamorphosing, so when they're turning from a little wormy caterpillar thing into their adult form, the intermediate is called a chrysalis, which is like a little, um, little almost plasticky shell that they create over themselves. Often they have little golden patches on them or other things. Mm -hmm. They're fascinatingly shaped, beautiful things. And so a moth, instead of producing a chrysalis, would produce a cocoon which is like a little sleeping bag kind of made out of silk so they weave themselves a little silken cocoon so that's another difference and the third difference and you can look for this in these photos that we're about to show you is the antennae so the antennae of a butterfly are club shaped so club shaped meaning they're sort of they're smooth they're glossy they're jointed they almost look like legs sticking out of the head of the butterfly um, whereas for a moth the antennae are very feathery. They're like a pipe cleaner or really like they're branched. They have all these feathers. And the reason for that is they're very good at smelling. So that, mm. that structure helps them. Um, it's like their nose. It's basically a nose on the face of the moth. So there you go. That's great. Um, those are so helpful. I'll definitely take a look for those three signs next time I'm out. Absolutely. Now, I just wanted to show people um, some of the beautiful macro moths that we have, a lot of people think moths are quite drab, but I would like to show you three examples of very undrab moths. So the first one is the IO moth. I think we have a look at those eye spots. So that's a perfect example of eye spots there. And eye spots, by the way, are a way of trying to get predators to eat. Um, they're going to take a bite out of that eye spot instead of taking a bite out of the body of the moth because the moth can actually persist with a little bit of damage to the wings. Um, now let's take a look at a second one, which is a Cecropia moth. Let's see what that Cecropia moth looks. Oh, there's those branched antennae. Look at that. This Beautiful. is a good, good sniffer here. You could definitely <laughs> tell. Now moths also have 
host plants, but they're a little bit less specific. A lot of them like to eat um, the leaves of native foliage trees. So like maples, beech, ash. They're not quite as um, as tight as like we were talking about the, the lady butterflies that really like specifically thistles. Mm. Moths are a bit more generalist. We've got one more moth. Um, that is a little bit more specific, and its its host plant is in the name. That's the rosy maple moth. Look at wow. those colors. <laughs> Look at that. Hot <laughs> and candy. Like, yeah. You thought it. You thought it. You had a great uh, comparison. How do, What do you think it looks like? <laughs> I thought it looked like a 1970s rock star, but <laughs> that's totally. just me. <laughs> I can see it. I can see it. Or maybe, or like a muppet or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. They're amazing. So, so it's just. So I hope if you leave with nothing else um, on your mind after this this Wildlife Wednesday, just that moths are cool, guys. Like moths yeah. are really fascinating creatures. Um. So, with yeah, that, right. I think we shall transition on. To, uh, oh. hmm. What's going on? Sorry. There we go. <laughs> moment. I don't know what that was about. Sorry. Okay, we're back. Um, okay. I don't see the comments anymore, Yarmila. So do you see any questions? I do. Yeah, sorry. Okay, well, we, we got some love for moths, for sure. And, okay. um, and yeah, there was a quick question about um, which, uh, from a late joiner, they wanted to confirm the thistle that um, painted ladies are attracted to. So Okay, yeah, good question, because there's a lot of non-native thistles mm. around, and they will use those non-native thistles, um, so you could still, you know, they, they do have a use, but I don't know that I would go out and um, plant those non-native thistles, but mm. what we do have are, there are field thistles, um, there are swamp thistles, there are pasture thistles, um, there are pitcher's thistles, which are actually a species at risk thistle, believe it or not, so cool. Um, and then if you live out west, I would love for you to grow an edible thistle. There's actually yeah. a thistle by the name Circium eduli, which is edible. Isn't that fascinating? I want to eat a thistle carefully, carefully. Carefully, carefully, <laughs> yes. Maybe with a little bit of prep. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, did you see any other burning questions there? Um, not right now, no. But um, if you have any questions, you can pop them into the comment section for sure. Absolutely. Okay, so with that, why don't we um, just transition over to trivia time. It's quiz time, folks. We want to know how <laughs> well you were paying attention during this whole this whole episode. So let's get started with that trivia. Here's the first question. What proportion of the 5,257 Lepidopteran species in Canada are moths? So you could say this as I mentioned it earlier. I mentioned that for every one butterfly species, there are how many moths? So it's a ratio of one to what? You could also express this as a, as a percentage if you uh -huh. feel like doing some quick math. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I wonder, I wonder, yeah, are we getting this, any... This is this is a good one because it's it might the answer might surprise a lot of people, I think. Yeah, yeah. Might not be what people are thinking. It's a little bit of a tricky one, yeah. but uh, I don't know. Anybody? I'm... Any takers? Any takers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, why don't we just show the answer? Yeah. The correct answer was 90%. So, mm. so it's a ratio of one to nine. So for every one species of butterflies, you have to learn nine species of moths if you want to learn all 5,257. Uh, and I challenge you to do that. There we go. Yeah, what? Uh, it's, uh, pretty close, Catherine. Pretty close. Yeah. Um, not too bad. Okay. There you go. Kothar there. got it. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, well, you've got the next question. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a little bit of a warm up question. See how closely you were visit uh, listening. So the rusty patched bumblebee was added to the Federal Species at Risk Act Schedule One in 2012. What was its designation? So what sort of risk uh, was it assessed at? Mm -hmm. what, what was the level? 
Yeah. yeah. So there's, yeah. And uh, yeah, schedule one is the list that, um, that identifies any species that is going to get some protection under the Species at Risk Act. I see Katrin yeah. has said that it was endangered. Okay, mm -hmm. that's an interesting answer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Any, any others? Any other guesses? There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Got it, Katrin. Well <laughs> done. Well done. Okay, let's head on to question number three, which is we're back in the realm of butterflies. So I mentioned an alternate common name, sometimes used in the United Kingdom, um, for the painted lady butterfly. Now, as a little bit of a hint, it does it does help you to remember the host plant of this butterfly. Yarmila mentioned that it sounded a little um, regal <laughs> or, or noble. Yeah. noble in a certain way. Does anybody remember this? It's, it's quite a lovely name, actually. I think I might start using it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see. Okay. Hmm. Give it a few more seconds. A few more moments. Yeah. Nope. Oh. There we go. The yeah. answer. Cynthia of the thistle. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. There we go. Kate. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Kate, give it a little late, but we'll we'll take it. We'll take it. Full points, to Kate. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Okay. okay. So this one's back to me again. The, what foraging characteristics of the rusty patched bumblebee make it an especially good pollinator? And you know what? I don't know that anybody's going to get this one because I didn't talk about this part. So, well, you know, we'll, we'll if there are any guesses, some, um, creative answers. What, yeah. what, could, what do you think, audience, could be a characteristic of a bee that would make it a really good pollinator? Just you can sort of logic this one out, I feel. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, what makes a good pollinator? Think of if you were a plant. What would you want your pollinator to, how would you like it to behave? That's right. Yeah. What would you like it to do to best pollinate you? <laughs> oh. This is a tough one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So the key to, two key things are that it has longer flight times than other bumblebees. So it's out there flying around for a lot longer than, than others. And it, it tends to visit a really huge diversity of plants in different habitats. So it is, it is, um, you know, getting in touch with a whole variety of plants and for a longer time, and that just increases the, the amount of pollination that it's able to do. When it's not robbing nectar, that is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go on to that final question for trivia, which is, could you please name one of the things that would tell you that a particular insect is a moth and not a butterfly? So I mentioned three ways that you can tell the difference. Do you think that something might be a lepidopteran? Uh, there were three different things that you could look at to confirm whether this is actually a moth or a butterfly, because now you know that some moths are very beautiful creatures. They're not drab and not all of them are active at nighttime. Oops, I gave you a little bit of a hint, a negative hint there. There were three specific things to look for and I wanna know the moth version of that. Ah, Jojo says, Look at the wings. Look at the antenna. Okay, good, good. Yep. There is one other thing. It was about the life cycle. Fuzzy antennae. Yes, Catherine yep. got it. Yep, that that was one of them. They're for the sniffing. <laughs> wings yeah, like flat, you Jojo. Go. You got it. Yep. Okay. Let's see it. So resting, flat resting wings. The cocoon. That that silken sleeping bag and the feathery antennae. That's how you can tell if you're looking at a moth. Amazing. Okay, so I think with that, our clever audience has made it all the way through trivia. I think with that, we will wrap things up for this particular Wildlife Wednesday. So I'd like to thank everybody. Oh, Michelle comes in at the end, cocoon versus chrysalis. You get it, you, you got your marks there. No problem, <laughs> Michelle. Um, so thanks to, to everybody for tuning in to this this May edition of Wildlife Wednesday. Of course, we do this every month in the last Wednesday of the month. Um, and so 
Next, the June edition is is a mystery topic. Mm. So that's going to be really exciting to to tune in for. Absolutely. Yarmila, would you like yeah. to say anything else in closing? I would. Thank you. Um, I spoke a lot about the In the Zone program at the beginning of this episode. So I just wanted to give people a little bit more information about where they can go. Um, it's uh, Our website is inthezonegardens.ca. And uh, we have lots of information there about um, where you can find native plants. So local native plant growers. And we also... Um, during the spring growing season while um, garden centers are open at Loblaw, that certain Loblaw centers are carrying uh, native plants. So do check those out. There's a list there and a map that you can find um, just for May and June. Uh, but we also have the list of the other native plant growers that do carry native plants all year round. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. So nice that people can take a positive action, transform their landscape, and help fight the dual crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change together. So with that, we will conclude this episode of Wildlife Wednesday, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank bye you. Bye, everyone. Bye.